Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Monday. Today, we are going to walk through the innate immune system. And I just had to put this funny little meme on here because in six years, I have only missed two days of school. One of those times was because my car was illegally towed, and the other time was because my husband took us out of town for our anniversary. And I've never actually missed school from being sick. So it's very awkward to be at home. I'm very, very happy that I am still healthy and well. I hope you guys are healthy and well also. And if you do find that you have to frequently miss school or miss work, hopefully over these next two PowerPoints, you will learn more about your immune system, ways to help boost your immune system, and how to keep yourself healthier so that you don't have to miss those things. So let's start with the lymphocytes. First, make sure that you remember the lymphocytes and the lymphatic system sound very much alike because the system is that functional grouping that is named after this primary leukocyte, the lymphocyte. There's different types of lymphocytes, so you want to make sure that you keep in mind that your T cells are dependent upon the thymus gland, the B cells, bone marrow, and then the natural killer cells we're actually going to talk about today those also come from the bone marrow, but you'll see how they actually function. Although most people, when they talk about the immune system, generally reference T cells and B cells the most. The natural killer cells are extremely important. So lymphocyte production is a process called lymphocytopoiesis. Say that five times fast. Lymphocytopoiesis involves the bone marrow, the thymus, and the peripheral lymphoid tissues. We start this process off with the hemocytoblasts within the bone marrow that are ultimately going to divide into two different groups of lymphoid stem cells. Remember, a stem cell is anything that is undifferentiated, a cell that can become anything within the body. So if we look at this picture here, what you can see is the hemocytoblasts are going to start this process for us. So let's circle that. Hemocytoblasts up here. Under the direction of this interleukin-7, we're going to get lymphoid stem cells that are going to divide up into our natural killer cells as well as our B cells. This is group 1. So everything that goes in this direction is going to be group 1. Anything that goes over here in this direction is group 2. The group 2 is not going to stay within the bone marrow, rather it's going to travel over into the thymus. So you remember the thymus because we've talked about it a couple of times, we talked about it in the endocrine system, we talked about it in the immune system when we did our overview PowerPoint. So this is going to take these cells under the influence of the thymic hormones and make our T cells. So remember T and T goes with the thymus. B, bone marrow. Natural killer cells also coming from the bone marrow. Ultimately, all three of these types, all three types of lymphocytes, are going to be circulating throughout the body in order to help our immune system function as it was intended. The natural killer cells are going to do what we call immune surveillance. Ultimately, their job is to destroy abnormal cells, and I will show you how they do that. Antibody-mediated immunity, think about the B, okay, the B is important. The B cell is ultimately going to give us our antibodies. I'm doing a terrible job with this circling here. This is going to be our antibody-mediated immunity, using antibodies to help the immune system destroy pathogens. And then the cell-mediated immunity is going to be our T cells. So the T cells are going to work on cells themselves in order to ultimately destroy them. So T cells will work on abnormal cells just like the natural killer cells will work on abnormal cells. The antibody mediated immunity, this is going to be happening within the plasma, within the fluid of the blood, so not necessarily in the cell itself. We'll see the difference in that in the next PowerPoint between the antibody-mediated immunity and the cell-mediated immunity. So for right now, make sure you keep in mind group one 
is our natural killer cells and our B cells that will do immune surveillance and the antibody mediated immunity. Group two is going to be those cells that migrate over into the thymus under the influence of thymic hormones become mature T cells so that they can do cell mediated immunity. Make sure you keep all of your cells and where they come from and what they're going to do kind of separate. So definitely utilize this picture in order to help you separate everything and keep everything straight. So again, for those of you who like words, uh, group one, this is everything that I already said that was on that picture. Group two, this is everything that's on that picture. So for my words people, those of you who don't like the pictures as much as you like the words, these are your two slides right here that explains what that picture was talking about. Now here's an additional picture uh, for those of you who need a little bit more detail in regards to the blood thymus barrier. This is kind of similar to the blood brain barrier where you have cells that don't allow stuff to get into the delicate areas of the brain because we want to protect it. So the blood thymus barrier is a barrier that is protecting these developing T cells so that they don't come against anything that could cause any abnormalities as they are trying to differentiate and become mature T cells. That's what you see in this picture here. So tissues will maintain different T cell and B cell population. Lymphocytes wander through tissues and they wander around the body because they're constantly checking just to make sure that everything is appropriate and they are looking for anything that is abnormal. So it's important that they have the ability to wander through these tissues and not be limited in the places where they have the ability to go. T cells will move faster than B cells and both of them have the ability to survive for many years. So really just depending upon which particular cell we're talking about depends upon how long its survival rate is going to be. T cells and B cells both retain their ability to divide and this is important because this helps make sure that we always have proper immune system function. So T cells can make more T cells, B cells can make more B cells, but you're never going to have a T cell that will make a B cell or a B cell that will make a T cell. Okay, Natural killer cells make natural killer cells. So this helps make sure that we maintain that immunity and resistance that helps our body stay healthy. Now for our immune response. This is the body's reaction to infectious agents or anything that is considered abnormal. So remember last time we talked about pathogens, those are viruses, bacteria, fungus, toxins. All of those things are abnormal substances. We have two different types of immunity within our system. We have what's called innate and what's called adaptive. The innate, make sure you remember that this is non-specific and this is what you are born with. Whereas the adaptive is very specific and this takes time for it to be developed appropriately. So as soon as you come out of your mother's womb, you already have the innate immunity. The things that are within innate immunity are the discussion points for today. And then next time we'll be talking about the adaptive immunity. So for the innate immunity, this is always gonna work the same way. It will go against anything that comes against the body that is abnormal. And we're really going to see a lot of work for the natural killer cells. This is different from the adaptive because the adaptive is actually going to use our T cells and our B cells and it depends upon a specific pathogen as to how it's going to actually attack and take care of those uh, abnormal pathogens that are entering into the system. So we'll talk about it next time. So for our innate defenses, these are going to block or attack any foreign substance key here cannot distinguish one pathogen from another. So make sure you remember that. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven innate defenses. So these are the seven that we're going to walk through today. You're going to want to make sure that you remember that all seven of these are things that people are born with. Right? So for those of you who like pictures, we've got the seven within 
the next two pictures. Physical barriers is number one. On this particular picture, what you can see is a picture of the skin. So we know the skin is the largest organ and it is a protective barrier from the external and the internal environment. So your skin has the ability to make secretions such as sweat and oil, it has hair. There's lots of different ways that your skin has the ability to protect against external invading agents. There's more than just the skin, so when we get into the word slide, you'll see other things as well that fall into that particular category. Phagocytes, remember when you think about the phagocytes, you always want to think about Pac-Man. The Pac-Man constantly just roams around trying to eat up all of the little dots. So the phagocytes within the body are just going to roam around and try to eat up all of the pathogens. The different types of phagocytes that you see here we're going to discuss in greater detail when we get to the word slides. And then immune surveillance, we already saw a little bit about that in regards to the natural killer cells, making sure that they have the ability to destroy any abnormal cells. Interferons are chemical messengers, so make sure you remember that word, chemical messengers. They help coordinate defenses against viral infections. So right now everybody is concerned with this viral infection that is occurring. So we'll talk about interferons and their role in protecting the body against viruses. You can see these interferons are released by activated lymphocytes, macrophages, or virus infected cells. Complement, think about if you are to be a complementary person or you are a helpful person or you assist complement is proteins that will assist antibodies in destroying pathogens okay so complement is a helpful system so these proteins that are utilized within the complement system are quite complex and I have a video for you guys to watch because there is a lot of detail that goes into the complement system but we'll talk briefly about the goals of the complement system as a whole and how it helps enhance the innate immunity. Inflammation, most people are familiar with. Remember, anything that is itis ending, I-T-I-S, whether that's dermatitis or arthritis or colitis, all of the things that end in itis are referencing inflammation. So this is a part of the innate immunity. There's seven different steps that occur with the inflammatory process. And we'll be talking about what the goals are within the inflammation process and how it's supposed to help the body. And then fever. Fever is also important because this has the ability to help the body respond to the things that we call pyrogens. So again, we'll talk more about those when we get into the word slides. See slide 29 for chronic inflammation. Uh, we'll briefly cover the chronic inflammation because it is different than acute inflammation. So whenever we get there, then we'll talk about that. But if you're already questioning, maybe you've heard that inflammation is really bad and you should eat anti-inflammatory foods, I'll explain the difference and break down acute versus chronic and how they differ from one another in regards to how they perform different functions within your body. For our physical barriers, so this is item number one on the innate immunity list. Again, outer layer of skin, we saw that in the picture. Hairs, we saw that in the picture. Now, epithelial layers of the internal passageways. So anything that's open to the external environment, whether that's your nose, your mouth, your urethra, all of those have an epithelial lining and a mucous membrane. So those are very protective and those are considered physical barriers to protect you from external pathogens. We also have things like lysozyme, these are enzymes that have the ability to destroy abnormal things. And then stomach acid. Make sure that you definitely remember this 
big star. When we go through the digestive system, we'll be talking about the role of stomach acid. Many people think that stomach acid is a bad thing, but this is actually a very important thing and it has a very important physiological function within our system. So it also is included as an innate immune defense system. Do not forget that. Phagocytes, again, these are our Pac-Men. So think about them as being police Pac-Men. So Pac-Men that don't just roam around eating things, but they're policing the body and making sure that they're removing any dangerous criminals from our system. We don't want criminals to hurt us, murder us, you know, stab us in the face or anything of the sort. So the phagocytes are actually going to help resolve these issues. Microphages, we know the difference between micro and macro is related to size. So the neutrophils and the eosinophils are the microphages. They have the ability to enter into the tissues to fight infections, just like the macrophages, but these are large cells that ultimately come from monocytes. So they are distributed all throughout the body and there's this very diffuse collection of cells that makes up what we call the monocyte macrophage system or the reticuloendothelial system. Because again, your whole system needs to be protected. So it's not like we can just have macrophages or macrophages in one or two places. We're going to have them scattered throughout the body. We have different types of macrophages. They include the fixed and the free. So fixed basically are called fixed because they just stay in one particular location. So there's an example of two of them there for you. The microglia stay within the CNS, whereas the Kupfer cells stay within the liver. Free macrophages, on the other hand, have the ability to move around the system. So they're traveling all throughout the body and they move through capillary walls we call that emigration. So think about a capillary wall is an endothelial tissue. So the E and emigration were migrating through the endothelium. They are attracted by chemicals or repelled by chemicals. This is a process called chemotaxis. Okay, so think about whenever you have a taxi it comes whenever you whistle or whenever you throw your hand up in the air. So these chemicals, whenever they send out a signal, they actually can attract or repel these macrophages to a particular area. This goes hand in hand with the fact that they are sensitive to these chemical messengers called the cytokines. We'll be talking about the cytokines here in a little bit but the cytokines are those chemical messengers that will draw immune system cells to a particular area as an alert to say, hey, there's something wrong over here. And then we have alveolar macrophages. So just think about the alveoli in the lungs, how much dust and debris and other things that we come into contact with on a daily basis as we just go about our day with regular breathing those macrophages within the lungs help make sure that it cleans up anything that gets down to those alveoli cells that are so imperative in normal respiratory function. Activated macrophages have the ability to respond to pathogens in a couple of different ways. So you can see there they can engulf it as we've been talking about the Pac-Man, so actually eating it and then destroying it with that lysosomal enzyme that I talked about earlier. They have the ability to bind to the pathogen so that other cells can come in and actually destroy it, or they can destroy the pathogen by releasing very toxic chemicals into the surrounding fluid. So phagocytosis actually begins with these three things that you see here. On this video, I encourage you to take a moment, stop right now, watch the YouTube video so that you can actually see the process of phagocytosis firsthand. It's really cool to see how these macrophages are going after these abnormal pathogens within the system so you can actually see those different processes of phagocytosis within that quick minute and a half video. 
All right, so let's get into the immune surveillance. When you think about the immune surveillance, I want you to think about military. So we know that the military is constantly going to be taking care of our country. So in surveillance, they are checking in on things, making sure that they're aware of things. Anything that comes against our country, the military is going to try to respond to immediately and make sure that they take a very, very, very big action on an enemy. That's what your natural killer cells do within your body. The enemy that it's looking at are these things here called antigens. So antigens are going to be present on cells and the natural killer cells are going to have the ability to distinguish between your own cells, so cells of self, versus other cells based upon the antigens that are present on the cell membrane. Once they figure out that there is an abnormal antigen, they immediately know this is not belonging here, so therefore we need to go ahead and address this. So on the next slide, I'm going to walk through the picture in order to show you how the natural killer cells actually do their job. For those of you who like the words, again, this is your slide right here. Everything that I'm going to say on the next picture goes to a particular slide of words. So here we go. Recognition and adhesion. So first we have to recognize, again, that there are antigens that are not like self. Once this is established, what's going to happen is this Golgi apparatus, the GA, is going to move. So this is basically like the military pulling their guns out and getting them ready, lining them up in order to shoot at the enemy. The guns don't always stay ready. The guns may stay holstered on the hip. Uh, the guns may be in a bag. There's different ways that the military can carry around their weapons. But ultimately, this realignment of the Golgi apparatus is all about getting ready to point the gun in the correct, correct direction. Okay? If we point the gun here and we shoot, we're going to miss the target. We need to make sure that we have the target lined up and we're ready to go. The bullets that are going to come out of the gun are called perforins. So these perforins are going to come from the Golgi apparatus and head towards the cell membrane. Once these perforins come through, if you look right here, this is a blow up of what's happening in picture number three, you can see that the natural killer cell is secreting these little perforins via exocytosis. They're coming out of the cell and they're going to the abnormal cell membrane. Once this happens, the perforin perforates or tears the cell membrane of the abnormal cell. And ultimately what it ends with is destruction of the cell membrane Therefore, the abnormal cell does not have the ability to survive because the cell membrane that is keeping it intact, making sure that the cell can actually function, has now been destroyed. So, as everything cuts apart, remember lysis means to cut, as everything cuts apart, now we have the destruction of this abnormal cell, which leads to cell death. That is the goal of the natural killer cells. Establish the recognition, align the gun, shoot the bullets, destroy the cell membrane, and cause cell death. And that's how it works. Now, there are tumor-specific antigens on the plasma membranes of cancer cells that can be identified as abnormal by the natural killer cells. Very important to know this. Some of you might not like to hear this, but it is truth. Natural killer cells regularly attack and kill cancer cells throughout your life. So whenever we're talking about cases of tumors that are now showing up on different imaging, generally the consensus is that this is something that has been going on for quite some time because the natural killer cells do have the ability to protect you as long as you are nourishing your system. This is one of the reasons why it is so important to make sure that you eat a good, healthy, clean diet. 
because your cells can only work with whatever you provide for them. If you are providing low quality, poor materials, they're not going to be healthy and strong. But if you are providing high quality, good nutrient dense foods, they're going to be able to do their job very well. So I tell all of my patients, think of your immune system as your warriors. The smarter, the faster, the quicker, and the stronger your warriors are, the better your immune system will be. If you do not do anything to support your warriors and to help them out, and they become slow, they become sluggish, they start to be lethargic, they don't have the ability to respond as fast, they can't do their job correctly, that is asking for trouble. So you do want to make sure that you constantly, constantly nourish your cells and help your warriors, warriors, W-A-R-R-I-O-R-S, to be as strong as they can be. So whenever you see some of those tumors, sometimes it's turned into situations where the cancer cells have overwhelmed the natural killer cells ability. Some cancer cells get smart and they get tricky. They learn how to avoid detection, which is called immunological escape, by either covering up their antigen so that the natural killer cell as it patrols the body doesn't have the ability to recognize it. So this is kind of like um, people who come in to the country as spies. They're really enemies, but they're projecting themselves as something else and they're kind of covering up their true identity. That's exactly what a, a particular cancer cell can do in order to avoid being attacked or there are some cancer cells that have the ability to actually destroy the natural killer cell. So they become a stronger enemy and therefore they kill the natural killer cell before it has the chance to kill the cancer cell. So there are different situations where those cancer cells although they have the ability to kind of escape immunological recognition, there are things that are currently in the works that are going to be able to uncover those antigens and help with the revealing of them so that the immune system can go after them and attack them appropriately in order to kill that cancer within the system. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about is cells infected with viruses. So they will present the abnormal proteins on their plasma membranes. Again, whenever the natural killer cells see something abnormal on a cell membrane, it is going to go and destroy it. So cells that have viruses within them are going to be destroyed even if they are our own cells. So if it's our own healthy cells, if it is infected with a virus, then the cell will display kind of like a red flag on the membrane to say, hey, there's something wrong with me, and then the natural killer cell will have to take it out. All right, moving on to interferons. These are small proteins released by those activated lymphocytes and macrophages that trigger the production of antiviral proteins. So these antiviral proteins don't necessarily block or inhibit the viruses from coming into the cell, but what will happen is they will block the viral replication that's occurring inside of the cell itself. In addition to blocking the viral replication, they're also going to stimulate the natural killer cells and the macrophages to come to that particular area and make sure that they're addressing whatever those virus infected cells are displaying again on the membrane. Interferons are one type of cytokine. When you think about cytokine, I want you to think about a cell phone. So we've got a lot of analogies going on here for the immune system, right? So you have police Pac-Man, which are your phagocytes. You have the military, which is the natural killer cells. Now we're talking about the cytokines, which are your cell phones. Cytokines in and of themselves are the chemical messengers that will aid in cell-to-cell -cell communication. So if you've ever played the telephone game where you put the cup on your ear and there was a string, or 
if you play the telephone game where you whispered one thing in somebody's ear and it went down the line. These are cell-to-cell -cell communicators, so they have the ability to basically send out information to say, hey, there's a problem over here. I need some leukocytes in this area to address whatever is going on. They do have the ability to upregulate and downregulate the immune response, and there are things that are called cytokine storms that have the ability to cause some really severe issues, including death, and we're going to actually talk about that in the next PowerPoint whenever we get more into adaptive immunity. So that is to come, but for right now, make sure that you remember cytokines as the cell phone. If I call somebody on my cell phone and say, hey, I have a problem, then that person can come to where I am at. So these are the messengers that say, hey, problem over here, come over here, I need your help and I need your assistance, Mr. Immune System Cell. There's three different types of interferons that we're gonna discuss. So we have alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha is the one that is produced by cells infected with the virus. So this can attract those natural killer cells in order to, again, stimulate the natural killer cell to be as if it is the military of the body and take out these infected cells. Beta is going to slow inflammation in a damaged area, and then gamma secreted by T cells and natural killer cells, and it's going to stimulate macrophage activity. So we have some that will attract and stimulate natural killer cells because of virus infection, we have some that will be secreted due to slowing inflammation. We have some that are going to be secreted by T-cells, natural killer cells, in order to get macrophages or Pac-Man over into the area and address, maybe engulf a pathogen or free. For the complement system, more than 30 different proteins produced by the liver that are going to be complementary to immune system function. So what these proteins do is assist the antibodies in destroying pathogens. They work in these things that we call cascades. And there's three ways that we can activate the complement system. Three different pathways, the classical, the lectin, and the alternative pathway, all have the ability to activate these proteins to assist in destroying the pathogen. I put a YouTube video right there that you can walk through. It's about a 14 minute video where he really breaks down how the, the complement system works. So I'm not gonna go into all of the details because he does a phenomenal job of drawing this out and it's much easier to understand whenever you can see all of these things, how they work individually and then how they work together as he goes through the drawing. So I encourage you to watch that video so that you can understand the complement system. For right now, I'm just going to go through a couple of brief things to kind of point your attention to. The classical pathway is the most rapid and effective mode of activation. So we have the three different pathways, but the classical pathway, most rapid, most effective. If we look at the three different pathways on the picture here, what you can see is I've circled on the classical, on the lectin, and on the alternative the same thing. We have activate an inflammatory response. Activate an inflammatory response. Activate an inflammatory response. So it doesn't matter which pathway, they're all going to activate an inflammatory response. You can see on the classical pathway that we're going to have an enhancement of phagocytosis. Same thing happens here. Enhancement of phagocytosis in the lectin pathway. And then in the alternative pathway, we've got binding to the bacterial cell wall. So what does all of this mean? If you look here, there are three effects due to complement. All three, all three, ultimately convert inactive C3 protein to activated C3B and C3A proteins. What that means is all three of these have the ability to do these three effects right here. 
once we have this killing of a pathogen due to cell lysis, you can call this the membrane attack complex or the MAC. So this is going to destroy that cell membrane, very similar to how we saw the natural killer cell destroying the cell membrane. Opsonization is another effect. So opsonization, we can see that one on the second picture. What opsonization is, is this is an enhancement of phagocytosis. So we're helping phagocytosis work even better. Remember this is a complement system. And then inflammation, release of the histamine by mast cells. Mast cells are very much involved in histamine release and inflammation. So whenever we have inflammation, this will attract and activate more phagocytes, accelerate blood flow to the area so that we can begin the healing process. Three effects of complement activation, three different pathways, ultimately all three pathways are going to convert an inactive protein to activated proteins in order to get these three reactions. We're going to kill it by lysis, we're going to enhance phagocytosis, or we're going to go through a process of inflammation. So let's talk about inflammation. This is localized tissue response to an injury. So as you can see here, this is triggered by any stimulus, any stimulus that kills cells or injures tissue. If you have ever had an ankle sprain, then you know what inflammation actually does. You've experienced it firsthand. Some of the cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation include redness, swelling, heat, pain, and the fifth sign that doesn't always get talked about is lost function. You may have heard this as rubor tumor, calor dolor. They're basically saying the same thing. If we're talking about redness or rubor, this is increased vascularity. So the blood vessels are opening up so that things can actually move through easier. Swelling is the blockage of the lymphatic drainage. Heat is due to the increased vascularity. And pain is because of the pressure or the chemical irritation due to structures that are nearby picking up those sensations of those chemicals that will cause pain. Ultimately, when inflammation happens, it's a signal to your system to slow down. So let's take the ankle injury. If you injure your ankle while you're playing basketball and there's inflammation in the area, all of a sudden, now you feel the pain. You start to think, you know what, this is hurting a little bit. I probably need to take a break. If you don't take a break, then you have the possibility of tearing tendons or ligaments or ripping them or maybe even breaking a bone. So the inflammation process is to slow a person down, alert them to a problem, signify that there's pain in the area so that they don't continue to go in the same direction they've been going in as the body works on healing the injury. So these are the effects of inflammation. We want to repair. Definitely important to repair because we cannot leave things broken, right? Part of the process of repair is going to lead to maybe some necrotic tissue, which we'll talk about in a minute, so the effects of inflammation aren't always pretty and they don't always look great, but there is a goal at the end of this. Part of the other goal is to slow the spread of pathogens. So if we say, for instance, during that ankle sprain, you fell down, you were playing on the concrete outside. If you fell, whenever you sprained your ankle, there's inflammation in the area, you've cut it, there's an abrasion, there's going to be that enhanced vascularity to help the blood flow get to the area quickly. We're going to bring immune system cells to the area quickly. And the goal is to slow the spread of any pathogens that were in the external environment. Maybe there was some bacteria or something on the concrete. We don't want that getting into the body and traveling further into the system, 
so the inflammation will help slow the spread of that while we also mobilize all of those defenses in order to help make sure that we can do the repair process. So that's what inflammation is there for. You can see this is a little example. This is actually in your book. So this is a skin example where if there's damage to the tissue, then there's chemical changes within the interstitial fluid. Remember we said mast cells are very important when it comes to releasing histamine. So as, as these chemicals get released and there's changes within the interstitial fluid, it will cause those things like the rubor, the color, the dolor, the redness, the swelling, the heat, the pain, as the vessels begin to dilate and there is increased blood flow to the area. Temporarily, we'll have clot formation in order to help slow the spread of any pathogens. And we're going to have white blood cells that are going to come to the area in order to start to do their job. We know neutrophils will attack bacteria, so if there is any bacteria that is trying to get into the system, the neutrophils are going to go and start eating that particular bacteria so it doesn't get any further. We know that the phagocytes are help, gonna help engulf any debris, so if there's anything in that particular area that needs to be cleaned up, then the phagocytes are going to do that. Ultimately, the end goal, because there's always an end goal, pathogen removal, clot erosion, and scar tissue formation. So many times after a person has injured, maybe let's say their ankle, they will have that scar tissue there. And whenever it comes to ligaments and tendons, because those are cartilage, it's a little bit harder for blood flow to really get to that area to bring healing. So some of that scar tissue that remains leave that person in pain for quite some time. Tissue repair, the time frame on it really depends upon what tissue is injured. Obviously your skin is going to heal a whole lot faster than the cartilage. Bone is very vascular, so with the very um, increased blood flow availability within the bones, it can heal pretty quickly but that cartilage is so slow to heal because of its avascularity. So scar tissue sometimes takes over and really keeps people from doing the things that they want to do. If you've ever had an injury like that, then you know what I mean. So remember in anatomy, structure and function always go together. If we're changing the structure of something and we're laying down a lot of scar tissue, then it does have the ability to change the function as well. So the products of inflammation include these three things here. So necrosis, this is local tissue destruction. Pus is necrotic tissue plus any debris, any fluid, dead cells. If you've ever had a, a pimple that you have popped, then you know what the pus looks like. An abscess is an accumulation of pus within an enclosed space. So if you've ever seen an abscess, then you know that those things are um, quite large sometimes and they can be really, really gross uh, whenever they get cut open. Spider bites sometimes lead to abscesses that are quite large depending upon what type of spider it is. And when that gets cut open, in order to drain the abscess, there's often a lot of pus and necrotic tissue in that particular area depending upon how long that patient has been suffering with that. But those are all products of inflammation that can happen as the body goes through the tissue repair process. Now, difference in your acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. As I spoke about earlier, I said I was going to mention this. So up at the top, you can see cortisol from the blank glands is meant to be anti-inflammatory to control the inflammatory response and shut it off once healing has taken place. If you remember, we talked about cortisol in the very beginning of the semester, so this comes from the adrenal glands. So what should happen is we should have the acute inflammatory response helps kill the pathogen and then ultimate end goal, repair the tissue, and then we're done. Unfortunately, if your system is not healthy and well, maybe let's say if you're a smoker, 
you're constantly bringing in lots of toxins into the system. The pathogens don't always get killed. The cells and tissues don't always get repaired. And when this happens, this can lead to an impairment in the immune system. It can lead to things like infection. And ultimately, this both of these can go back and forth and lead to issues of chronic inflammation. Acute inflammation and chronic inflammation are not the same. So acute inflammation is an inflammatory response that is meant to kill pathogens and help repair tissue. Chronic inflammation is something completely different. And if you look over here on the right hand side at the purple, chronic inflammation has been linked to every chronic disease from Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, etc. Inflammation is at the core of all of these things. So again, this is why you want to make sure that you have a strong army within your system. You have to, have to, have to take care of your warriors. What are some of the things that can lead to this chronic inflammation other than an acute inflammation that wasn't addressed correctly? Look right here. Poor diet and lifestyle leading to oxidative stress. We talked a little bit when we went through the blood vessels about how sugar consumption can really change what's going on on the endothelial lining, the tunica intima within the blood vessels, and create a lot of reactive oxygen species whenever you have hyperglycemia. So that oxidative stress, anything that is pro-oxidant, like aluminum, is going to lead to things like chronic inflammation and of course cell dysfunction and damage. So eating these poor foods, having uh, poor lifestyle choices, including not moving your body, not getting enough sleep, um, not making sure that you're protecting yourself whenever you're in areas where the pathogens are high, where you have the ability to chronically be exposed to certain things, whether you work in, a, in an environment where you're highly exposed to toxic chemicals, all of these things can cause issues within the system. And once it becomes overwhelmed, it can lead to that chronic inflammation, which ultimately can lead to a multitude of diseases that you really don't want to have to deal with. So we want to make sure our immune system stays strong, we stay healthy, we eat good things, we make good choices. Make sure we stay active, get plenty of rest, plenty of sleep. Make sure you're constantly drinking water to help flush your system, etc., etc., etc. All right, and lastly, we're going to talk about fever. So fever is a body temperature greater than 99 degrees. This helps increase your metabolic rate in order to accelerate your defenses. This also will inhibit some viruses and bacteria from continuing to replicate. So fever does become very important in some situations and taking a fever reducing drug actually will sometimes give the virus or the bacteria a new lease on life. It cannot always survive at a high temperature. So if your temperature starts to go up, and then you take something to make your temperature go down, well, you just gave your virus, your bacteria, whatever is inside of your body that is trying to fight off, the ability to continue to live on and you just accelerated the amount of time, or prolonged, I should say, the amount of time that you may have to deal with this infection or this illness. So, make sure that you understand that fever is part of the innate system and there is a reason for it. Pyrogens are fever inducing agents that can be produced by a number of different pathogens as well as our own different um, portions inside of our body. So we call those endogenous pyrogens such as interleukin-1, interferons. Those also have the ability to be pyrogens. Ultimately pyrogens cause the hypothalamus to raise the body temperature. And whenever it raises the body temperature, then all of the metabolic reactions can take place a whole lot faster. 
whenever this happens, then anything that is moving within the system, say the white blood cells are trying to get to a particular area, they can be mobilized a lot quicker and we can speed up the repair process. So it's very important to understand that you don't always want to immediately decrease the temperature. There's different temperature ranges for different age groups. Whenever you're looking at when should I do something in regards to lowering the temperature with a medication, um, those are different numbers for let's say a baby versus somebody who's 12 versus somebody who's 112. Those are all different numbers so you want to be aware of those changes as you look at different age groups. There are things that also can help naturally lower fever. So before you go straight into medication, supporting the immune system and supporting the body should be number one in order to help that person with their fever. So on this very last slide, we're gonna end with this, boosting immunity and thermography because not everybody knows what thermography is, but everybody should know especially as we move into a time where we've got mammograms that have been shown to give a lot of false positives. Thermography is something that people should be aware of. It is a way to kind of assess if there is chronic inflammation in different parts of the body. So Dallas Thermography Center has a website where they answer a lot of questions about thermography, its use, how they can basically look at the system as a whole and determine level of health within the system. So I highly encourage you to look up Dallas Thermography Center if you have any questions about any of that or if you have any patients who are concerned about getting mammograms, concerned about the radiation, concerned about the discomfort, things of that nature. And then the very first uh, website that I have right there is for really good information on autoimmune diseases. As these things start creeping up more and more and more in our society, again, chronic inflammation can be at the core of this, so we can always address that, but different autoimmune diseases have their different complexities, and there's a lot of things that have to go into supporting these patients in particular. This is um, a whole lot more that they need to do in order to help their immune system than the you know regular Joe Schmo, um, but eat, sleep, and exercise are important for everyone. Everyone should always make sure they're eating well, sleeping well, and moving well, and of course, thinking well. I put some top supplements on there to help immunity. Every day, everyone should take a good whole food, multivitamin, a fish oil, and then vitamin D, either the supplement or the sun. I know not everybody likes to get out in the sun, they don't always have the time to get out in the sun, so if that's you, then definitely make sure that you do have that vitamin D in some sort of supplement form if you're not eating enough in the food form because it is imperative for the immune system to function appropriately. The sun, for those of us who do want to get out in the sun, is the best way to get the vitamin D, so I still highly encourage that. You don't want to be out in the sun until you're burning, of course, but at least 15-20 minutes a day out in the sunshine without the sunscreen on in order to make sure that, that is absorbed into your skin. And then the other supplements that you see there, just make sure that whenever you are buying supplements that you are buying something of good quality. Oftentimes the supplement prices correlate directly with supplement effectiveness. So not everything is a good quality, not everything is worth buying, and not everything is going to do the things that the labels proclaim it to do. So that's why it's important to make sure that you research, you really look into it in great detail before you decide to take something. So I hope you guys have a great day. Go make your immune warrior strong. Have really good foods. Go get some exercise. Sleep well tonight and have a great rest of your week.